Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to a one of the uh, close-up uh, Ford School uh, speaker series from the Education Policy uh, uh, lecture series we have here. Today is uh, my uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce Roland Fryer, who uh, is a colleague and a friend, uh, someone who I knew uh, way back when he was uh, less famous, but uh, I'm glad he has uh, agreed to come and talk about some really interesting work he's doing on the Harlem Children's Zone. Um, before I uh, forget, I'd like to thank some of the folks that helped organize this. First, thanks to the Ford School for co-sponsoring this. Thanks to Beth Rebar, Tom Avaco, uh, Jill and Katie in the communications office uh, for helping put all to get put together this, uh, and to Bonnie Roberts as well. Um, and so. Uh, Roland is uh, an economist. He is the Robert uh, Barron Professor of Economics and CEO of the Education Innovation Laboratory at Harvard University. Um, his kind of original training and work, for those of you who may know him, was kind of more in economic theory, which has lots of funny Greek letters and mathematical expressions. Um, he has moved to some extent, uh, not completely, over to kind of the applied microeconomics uh, side, uh, looking at a, a host of interesting education policy and programs. Um, he, uh, in, prior, uh, in prior lives, he served as the Chief Equity, uh, Quality Officer of the New York City Department of Education in 07, 08. Um, and uh, he has a number of awards that are, are listed here you can uh, read including the recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Um, uh, the 2009 Time 100, Time Magazine's annual list of the world's most influential people. Um, and uh, most importantly for our uh, case here, Roland is a incredibly bright and articulate and engaging speaker, so I'm sure everyone will enjoy the talk. Um, the, the, the standard is that, uh, Roland, you can decide how many, how many questions to accept as you go. I think we'd, it goes to 5.30, so maybe at the leave a few minutes at the end for questions. Um, and with that, uh, I'll let Roland take it away. All right, thank you. <laughs> Brian's just being modest. When I uh, first got into education research, I asked one of my advisors, I said, you know, I want to think about going to education. I think it's interesting. He says, yeah, you really ought to be like Brian Jacob if you want to be good at this. So. <laughs> Uh, it is so good to be here. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm incredibly excited today to talk about <clears throat> some work we've been doing um, with the Harlem Children's Zone. And um, you guys, Michigan time is 10 minutes late. Do I get to go to 5.40? Or is it... Uh, <laughs> as long as people stay. Yeah. Oh, well, we've got some time. Uh, I, I'm going to leave for my flight. But other than that, we can, we can stay and, and hang out. So look, I think the, the format I like the best uh, is that you should ask me questions as we go along. I, I really don't like it when I'm in the, your chair and someone is talking and I'm confused and uh, there's a burning question in my head and I can't ask it until 45 minutes ago and then at my age I forget it. So, you know, it's so like just, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, uh, yell it out, whatever. We'll, we'll get to it and, um, uh, but feel free to ask them as, they, as, they, as, as we go along. But, but let, me, let me go ahead and get started. All right, so here's a quick outline of what I want to accomplish um, uh, between now and 5.30. I'll give you some motivation behind why I think uh, the 97 blocks in Harlem are an incredibly rich laboratory for social science, uh, social scientists to understand some deep questions that we've been thinking about for some time. Uh, I'll briefly and very briefly go through the related literature. Um, I'll give you a brief history of the Harlem Children's Zone for some of you who don't know. Uh, what Jeff Canada uh, and his staff are doing. Uh, then I'll tell you about all the data that we've collected and our econometric framework and, and, and our results. And then I'd like to draw a bright line after the results. Okay, I'm going to give, I, I want to be very clear about a few things. Like I'm going to give you results that I believe in, and then we're going to talk about stuff that I have no clue about. <laughs> all right? And, and that's kind of the fun stuff, but I want to be very crystal clear about what I know and what I don't know. Uh, the results that come from our identification strategy, I believe in what mechanisms are involved, how you break those down, how do you move forward, how do you take this and scale it, I have no clue, all right? I, mean, I got a little more than a clue, but not much. And so I want to make sure that you understand that is a very speculative discussion 
uh, and I'm happy to have it. I'm not shying away from it, but uh, I believe much more in my numbers than I do in what's next. <laughs> All right, so here's the bottom line, because I'm sure at some point I have this great quality that I tend to piss people off that you're going to leave. Um, the Harlem Children's Zone is enormously successful. Uh, at increasing the academic achievement of the poorest minority students uh, in Harlem. And I don't really have much of a clue why. Okay? It feels like, and pardon the analogy, maybe it's extreme, but I feel like you know, we've found a cure for a disease that's been plaguing us, and the, the cure is something like one apple slice four nights a week for two and a half weeks, broccoli every nine minutes, a really dynamic doctor and nurses that seem to care about you. All right? So I, yeah, I really feel like there's something special going on in the Harlem Children's Zone, but I don't really know what. And the problem with people like Jeff Cannon is he likes to do a lot of things to help people, and that's great, but not for statistics. Okay? And, <laughs> And um, so, you know, I, I, think we ha I think we have a result here, and I want to show it to you, but at the end of the day, I don't know why they are having such amazing gains. In the classic academic way, I kind of know what, it may, what it's not, <laughs> but I don't know what it is. All right? So here's the motivation. The racial achievement gap is really, really big. All right? It's about the gaps arise at age two. You don't really see them earlier than that. That could be because they're not there, or it could be because we're not good at testing nine-month-old kids. Um, I think we're pretty good at testing nine-month-old kids. I think there are no gaps there, but that's a, that's a different subject. I'm happy to talk about that later. Uh, there are about 0.64 standard deviations in math, the gaps are, and 0 0.40 standard deviations at school entry. Now, Brian told me this was um, a mixed audience, mixed in the sense of, some folks know what a standard deviation is, and some folks don't know what a standard deviation is. No problem. Uh, you should think of it this way. The average kid gains in the average American public school about .08 standard deviations per month. OK? So if I do my math right in math, they are black kids are about eight months behind in math, about five months behind in English language arts when they enter school. All right? Uh, you probably know this from the Nate, but the average black 17-year-old reads at the proficiency level of the average white 13-year-old. In our urban centers, this is nationally representative data, in our urban centers, it's much worse. You know, I do a lot of work in D.C. And, uh, you know, if you go to D.C., if you look at the Nate, 12% of the kids are um, performing math at grade level, 8% are reading at grade level in Washington, D.C. Okay? You know, it's... <laughs> This business is so hard trying to, you know, uh, help increase achievement. And every now and then you get a, a big bonus, a big, you know, boost, and you feel great about yourself, but then you get kicked right down. It happened to me uh, this fall. I was in D.C. with one of our uh, schools because I like to be in our schools. We're, we're doing these financial incentive experiments, and I like to be there the first time they give the checks because we take so much flack from all the adults. At least the kids really like it, and so I like to be there with the kids when they get their first check. <laughs> So I was there with the kids when they got their first check, and the kids were going crazy. They were so happy about the money, and, da, 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 and they had earned so much, and I was so excited. I said, man, well, I think we're really doing something here. And a fight broke out <laughs> next to me while we were giving out checks. And I said, hey, man, you got to separate that. I said, what, what, what are you guys fighting over? He said, mister, tell him that 38 is bigger than 42. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what to do. I was like, well, you know, I don't know. Anyway, there are many attempts to close the team together. Because <laughs> the kid who thought 38 was bigger than 42 was bigger than me. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, there have been many attempts to close the achievement gap. There have been early childhood programs, uh, lots of stuff, small schools and smaller classrooms. There have been school choice, voucher stuff. You know, people tried to find systematic ways to make better public schools. We've had neighborhood stuff where we've moved people out of their, you know, poor neighborhoods and moved them to less poor neighborhoods, all sorts of desegregation. You guys all know this. We've tried a whole lot of things in the past three decades, and I don't think we've had big results. Um, in fact, there's a, there's, a, there's a great book called So Much Reform 
uh, so little, res uh, I think so little success, I think this is a typo, but anyway, it, it, it goes through these things. I think this lack of success has played into a pretty rancorous debate about whether schools alone can actually close the achievement gap. Okay, and when the, in the uh, run up to the presidential election, uh, there were two kind of groups that were, they, there wasn't that much distance between them, but, but they basically were kind of staking out their claims on this dimension. Some folks said schools are alone or enough, that was the equal opportunity, equal education equality project. And others said you need a lot more than schools. You need a lot of social supports, et cetera. Uh, turns out Jeff Canada signed both petitions. I don't think we can get any data from that, but uh, it shows that he's a smooth character. Um, what I'm interested in is trying to understand whether or not schools alone can close the achievement gap or whether or not we do need these community investments. Okay. Let me be very clear. I am not that interested in the Harlem Children's Zone per se. I'm not interested in evaluating a particular charter school or a set of charter schools, right? Uh, you know, since these results have come out, I've gotten lots of calls from people saying, can you give me some results like Jeff? <laughs> you, <know>. uh, <laughs> you think I'm lying. So um, uh, I, I'm not interested in that per se. W what we're interested in is the bigger question, which is you got community investment. Should you invest in the community programs that we all know a lot about? Should you in totally invest in schools if you want to close the achievement gap? Right? And it turns out that these 97 blocks in Harlem are a pretty good laboratory of at least trying to start to think about whether or not schools alone are enough or whether or not you need community investments. So um, when I grew up in my neighborhood, the easiest way to piss someone off is to step on their new shoes. In academia, the easiest way to piss someone off is not have them on your related literature slide. <laughs> It's true, and it's likely because all the academics I know have bad shoes. Um, so I don't do that. I don't put anyone up on the related literature side. I know a lot of people in this room have written incredibly important papers in this literature, uh, uh, but I, I, I don't do that. So he, here's my very brief related literature. Okay? There is a huge literature on the racial achievement gap. Lots of folks have contributed to that. Uh, the early childhood literature, there have been a bunch of stuff on school inputs, charter schools, class size, teacher quality, et cetera. It's a bunch of stuff on neighborhoods, peers. This really, the Harlem Children's Zone kind of putting all this stuff together. Uh, and it's very related to a lot of these literatures that, uh, that you have contributed to. Okay, here's a brief history of the Harlem Children's Zone. Just in case uh, you, you haven't seen Jeff on Oprah promoting it. Uh, it started in 1970 as New York City's first truancy prevention program. It was called Reedland Center uh, for Children and Families. Until the late 1990s, basically Reedland was an amalgam of after-school programs that, in Jeff's words, helped a handful of kids escape the neighborhood cycle of violence and poverty, but allowed many more to slip through the cracks. So his exact quote is, I was helping them by the tens and losing them by the thousands. Okay. Uh, so Jeff decided to create a new organization to focus on changing the whole neighborhood. All right? uh, and that's why he dubbed it the Harlem Children's Zone. The idea was to address all the problems that poor kids were facing, from bad apartments to failing schools, violent crime, chronic health problems, uh, with a kind of cohesive web of services from birth to college. Okay? Um, HCZ started as a 24-block area. It expanded to 64 blocks in 2004, and now it's a 97-block area in Central Harlem. Okay? Now, I know there's a lot of, I, I, I notice a lot of my colleagues here who are superstar statisticians much better than I am. This is not the good part of Harlem, okay? <laughs> Don't worry about that. This is the central Harlem, right? This is just Harlem. Now, here are a lot of the programs they have. They have their charter schools, um, which admit by lottery, which we're going to use. They have a bunch of early childhood programs. So you've got baby college, right? Um, it's not for the babies. It's for the parents. So baby college is a nine-week parenting program where the parents come and they learn things about how to be a parent, like um, putting up whatever. The, you, you, Brian's got like three, three kids. So he's, he's, he's my, he's my like idol on this stuff. I have zero kids that I know about. Um, <laughs> so I just like to be honest. Um, so 
th there's a socket plug thing that you cover that you cover the plugs with, right? Okay, so they teach you to do that stuff. My grandmother didn't know anything about that. She just thought survival of the fittest. If you're dumb enough to electrocute yourself, <laughs> that's, that's just you. Um, they also teach about uh, discipline. Uh, one of the most famous series of classes in the, in the baby college is about um, not spanking your kid uh, and using alternative forms of uh, discipline, something my grandmother also didn't know about. Um, <laughs> after you go from baby college at, at three years old, uh, there's a three-year-old journey, which is a very similar parenting program for, for parents with three-year-olds. Then there's the Harlem Gyms, which is uh, like Head Start on Speed. Uh, it has a four-to-one student-to-teacher ratio. Uh, kids learn three languages in the Harlem gyms. Um, it, it, it's basically a preschool program. Uh, just one thing of note, baby college, uh, your parents can go there as soon as, you know, when they're expecting parents, okay? Uh, and one thing that is pretty unique about the Harlem Children's Zone is you don't just go sign up for these programs, that you're actively recruited for them. So he has a whole list of full-time employees and volunteers that go door to door in project buildings, in laundromats, at the check cash and place on the corner, and when they see someone with a small child, they say, you need to be in baby college, it's free, da 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 da. All right, so in elementary school, he's got a bunch of after school programs, same thing with middle school programs, high school, college, you see he's got a bunch of stuff here, okay? And What's interesting, what's nice about it, oh, that's not good. Okay, let's hope that doesn't happen again. That was a map <laughs> of the Harlem Children's Zone, and what, it, it, there are borders there. And uh, let's go back to it, you can imagine. Okay, there are borders here in this map. <laughs> and um, what's interesting about the Harlem Children's Zone is if you live inside the borders, you're actively recruited for that list of programs I just showed you. However, there are also three to four charter schools in there, and those admit by lottery, right? So you can see where I'm going with this. There's some people sign up for the lottery. Most of them live in the zone. Some of them get the schools, others don't. Everyone gets the community programs, okay? That's the type of variation I'm gonna be using to try to identify schools versus communities, okay? In the end, I'll be able to tell you that it ain't communities alone. I don't know if it's schools or schools interacting with the communities that are the most important. Although I'm going to make an argument that it's just schools, but it's an argument. It's, I don't have the data to be you able have to put your name in the lottery? Uh, you do have to put your name in the lottery. Again, you're actively recruited to do so. And there's no stipulations for the lottery. It's not like some charter schools that say everyone's invited as long as they sign a parent pledge. Or, you know, you can do it uh, if you satisfy the following criteria. In, in fact, I'm going to show you data, at least on observables, that these kids look just like every other kid in, in Central Harlem. How many but their kids? parents might not be. Their, their parents, absolutely. I mean, any lot, you know, I'm going to do two things. I mean, let, let me get to my, love the question, you're right. I've thought about it, I'm not sure I'm going to satisfy it. <laughs> okay. What percentage of kids usually get in or signed up for it? Uh, half, because about 200 come in, they only have 100 slots. Okay, here's the data. Uh, we combined two data sets, one from the Harlem Children's Zone administrative file, so we went and, uh, to the zone and helped them digitize their administrative files that actually have um, their lottery winners and losers. Okay? Um, we also have data from Baby College and Harlem Gems of all the kids who have actually gone in. Subsequent to the time I made this slide, we also have data on every single community program time in and time out for all the kids who have gone through that. As you might imagine, uh, it's taken a few trusty, dusty undergrads to um, get that data into a working format, but we're, we're working on it. We merged that data with the Department of Education at New York data, where we have um, achievement data, attendance, et cetera, all the administrative data from 0304 to 0708, okay? And we have the admin files for mastery lottery winners and losers to the achievement data. So as long as you're still inside New York City public schools, that's Manhattan and the other boroughs, then you're in our data set, okay? Test scores are only available for grades three through eight. One second. Attendance and promotion data are available for all years. What yes, ma'am. What national data set did you use from the Department of Education? Uh, this is the Department of Education in New York City. I'm, okay, but what particular uh, demographic did you use? Did you use that set of data from 
the Department of Ed to compare with the children's zone? Yeah, so the, what? in New York City, the New York City DOE, they keep data on every single kid in... So it's every child? Every single child. So we have 10 years worth, of, it's five years there, but we have 10 years worth of data now and all 1.1 million kids for every year. It's a state thing set rather than a national. It's a, it's a city, New York City Department. It's a city. Yeah, but it's, it's all five boroughs. So okay. if the kids move to Buffalo, we don't have it. And how many, how many children there? Um, we have about 10 million. And it's 1.1 million in the New York City uh, school, uh, schools. Yeah, it's great for experimentation. But, uh, yeah. No, it's funny because I was there as the chief equality officer. I hate that title so bad. Chief equality officer. Um, but um, uh, they want, it's a long story why that title came out. It was not my idea. But you know, it, it, New York City is so big. Like I, I remember sitting in my little cube next to Joel Klein, and I'd say, hey, hey how, how many schools do you have? And they'd say, you know, that's an interesting question. I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder that kid don't know if 38 bigger than 42. <laughs> All right, so, so that, that's what we have. We have New York City Department of Ed data, and we have our home children's own stuff, and we're going to merge those, merge those two. All right, so here, here's how we, how we did that. Um, we matched the data um, using the following algorithm. So we took your last name, your first name, and date of birth, okay, and matched you to the New York City Department of Education uh, with various abbreviations and alternative spellings, et cetera. Okay. Here's the quality of the matches we got. For the Harlem Gems, we got 91.2% of the kids who went through Harlem Gems. We found them in the New York City data um, at some point. In the kindergarten treatment, we got 92.5. In the control, we got 89.2. In the middle school treatment, we got 90.6. In the control, we got 85.4% of the kids. Again, if you move outside the city, we don't have you. Or if you, you know, if your name is, uh, you know, Caitlin with a Q in between, and we didn't get the Q, then we don't find you either. Um, my former colleague, Caroline Hoxby, one of her students, estimated that one can expect about 90% based on natural attrition. We're in that ballpark. And the nice thing about the results I'm going to show you is th they're, they're so large that, like, even if we took the control kids and said they, the ones we can't find were really terrible, we're st I mean, the, the bounds on these estimates will still, uh, e even, in the, even in the lower bound estimate, uh, you'll see big effects. Okay, so here's the econometric framework into your question. We're going to do two statistical strategies. One, we're going to use the lottery. The other, we're going to use IV. Okay, so here are the lotteries. New York State dictates that oversubscribed charter schools allocate enrollment offers via random lottery. Uh, lottery winners will form a treatment group. Lottery losers will form a control group. So the ITT, the intent to treat estimate, is the effect of being offered admissions into the Harlem Children's Schools. Okay? So a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you is going to be ITT effects, right? the intent to treat. It's kind of like lower bounds. So this means right, the effect of being offered admissions. That means you, Brian wins the lottery. He doesn't go. I'm still going to count him as a Harlem Children's Zone kid. Okay? Or if he goes for two days and leaves, I'm still going to count him as a Harlem Children's Zone kid. That's the intent to treat effect. All right? Um, and we're going to estimate that by having the outcome on the left-hand side for each individual eye. We're going to control for some basic demographic stuff, and we're going to include a variable for whether or not you've been treated. That's the ZI. Okay? So gamma is going to estimate the treatment effect. Now, the treatment on the treated, which technically not an upper bound, but it answers a different question, is the effect of actually attending the Harlem Children's Zone Charter Schools. This estimate is going to be obtained by basically instrumenting for whether or not you went with your original assignment. So we need something that's correlated with whether or not you go to Harlem Children's Zone. Okay? And <clears throat> that's going to be what's correlated with that, your actual original lottery assignment. Okay? I just want you to notice two things. I don't want to get bogged down in the technical details unless you have questions. But one estimate is the effect of being offered admission. That's the ITT. The other is the effect of actually going. <laughs> treatment on the treatment. Okay, well, my, my, my question was, was, was how, did the, how did the students get into the pool that was subject to lottery? So they were actively recruited by, by the, by the uh, staff of the Harlem Children's Zone? That's like, not a random process. 
No, no, they, they well, it, it's not a random process, but it's an exhaustive process. They go out in these 97 blocks, and they knock on the doors, they go to the laundromats, et cetera, and they try to get people to sign up. Now, who signs up is not a random process, that's for sure. That's what I'm saying. And, okay, so two things. One, I will show you on observables that they look very similar. And two, we do IVs so that we don't have to actually, so this will help us with the external well, validity. What percentage of the eligible students are really signed up for the lottery? That, that would be I don't know the denominator because I don't know how many people they contacted. No, just of the students in the region that are eligible to be in the lottery. What percentage? I, I don't know off the top of my head because I don't know how many kids are in the 97 blocks. I think, uh, I don't know. I don't even want to guess. I, if you send me an email when I get home tonight, I can find the number out for you. Okay. Um, again, I want to underscore that this isn't a problem with any lottery-based analysis. And two, what I like about the Harlem Children's Zone is that they actually actively recruit people who wouldn't sign up on their own. So we, the, the two important issues, which you just got at one of them, with lotteries. One, uh, the kindergarten lotteries, which uh, were not sufficiently oversubscribed when we have the data. And two, lotteries are not necessarily externally valid. Okay? Who signs up for the lottery could be very different from um, the treatment effect that would happen for the kids who actually didn't sign up. So, we're going to complement the lotteries with an instrumental variable um, uh, specification. So we're going to employ a very simple IV strategy using the interaction between a student's address and their cohort. Okay? So let me just explain this in words. The identification is going to be driven by two forces. One, a comparison of kids within the zone who were of eligible age in that year relative to others who were not. Okay? So the Harlem Children's Zone schools opened in 2004. They only opened, if, and they were only, you were only eligible if you were in kindergarten and in sixth grade. So one of our basic counterfactuals in our IV estimate is to say, okay, let's compare the achievement of the kids who were in sixth grade and eligible that year versus the kids who were in fifth grade and who were ineligible in the zone. Just, sorry, no, fifth grade is a bad one because they'll be eligible next year. Seventh grade in the zone and who will never be eligible for the Harlem Children's Zone. Okay? And the second piece of this is a comparison of kids who are, el who are of eligible age who are close to the zone versus those that are not. Okay? It's the interaction of those two. Jesus. Are, are all my slides this way? This is not. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so what are the threats to this IV strategy? Where could it go wrong? Well, if the instruments are correlated with unobservable determinants of outcomes, then we're in trouble. For example, if high-achieving people move into the zone, when they have kids who are eligible for the lottery, then we're in trouble. Now, did that happen? I don't know, but I can tell you that you're eligible for the lottery no matter where you live. So moving would not have helped you in any way get your kid into this school. Okay? Two, address specific shocks. Now, so if individuals inside the zone re receive some sort of positive shock that is not received by other kids inside the zone, Right? Or, um, or, sorry, other kids outside the zone or any other cohorts inside the zone. What do I mean by that? If I'm giving this talk and Brian says, oh, Roland, I forgot to tell you, in 2004, I went into the Harlem Children's Zone and I gave lectures about how cool it was to be an economist and that if you really study hard in school, <laughs> you too can be an economist, I would be screwed. Okay? Well, I mean, I'm sure that has no treatment effect, but anyway, so I, but if, if, if you imagine, <laughs> the biggest assumption I'll make all day is the fact that Brian has a treatment effect on these kids. Um, uh, so, but if you imagine that Brian had a program that had a big treatment effect, and he did it in the precise year that we're measuring, and he did it only inside the zone and kicked out kids who are outside the zone, then the IV strategy would be invalid. This, what you're talking about now is just how you're going to estimate the effect of the attendance in the charter school itself, no. as opposed to the effect of the, the community services and so forth? Yes, this is the, I'm, what I'm talking about now is how I'm going to measure the effect of uh, uh, the impact okay. of the charter schools, and I want to compare these IV estimates with the lottery estimates. Okay, and you're going to, and the, you think that the, the, I'm asking because the inside the zone, outside the zone, obviously is going to influence um, how likely they were to have 
receive the recruited for services. Exactly. That's okay. the whole point, right? Is and what I was going to show you with this quick time decomposer thing is that if you look if you take a line, and it's in the paper if you have it, if you go towards the border of the zone and you look at the probability that you're going to sign up, that probability is pretty flat and then as you get close to the zone it starts to go up, even outside the zone. Okay, so, you know, in the, in the same way people have used distance as an instrument, we're using distance times cohort as, as the instrument. Okay. I hope the rest of these slides are here. Let me show you some results. This is a problem because I actually don't have the, uh, this is a real, I did this on a Mac and this is not like That's working. <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Uh, three minutes. <laughs> uh, so, how, can, how should we do this? Um, I have a Mac too. Can someone have a, if you have a card, I will PDF it on my Mac and uh, then we can put it on this thing as PDF, right? <clears throat> Sorry for the technical glitch here. Okay, I don't need that anymore. Okay, cool. I just want to show you I had a map. I know you think I was lying, but we got a map. Uh, so this is 116th Street, it's 125th Street, Madison or so. This is where the zone's middle schools are, right? About 134th Street, uh, yeah, 131st Street. And over here, that, that's where the elementary schools are. The elementary school is, is, is away from the middle school, et cetera. And I think that has some interesting hypotheses about what's, what's going on there. But that's, the, that's that map. Got everything for you now. Okay, here's the thing I promised before. So here's, now I have no pointer. That's okay. Um, uh, so here's where the identification's coming from. Okay, so if you are in the previous cohort, so if you were a year older, if you were in... Uh, first grade, when the lottery was for kindergartners, you can't get in. So uh, you see that the black line is the percent enrolled, uh, 100 meters, 1,000 meters from the zone, 500 meters from the zone, et cetera. This is going towards the border, which is a little counterintuitive, but going towards the border, getting closer and closer to the border of the Harlem Children's Zone. What we did was we mapped um, all the kids in 1,000 meter uh, uh, away from the zone using ArcGIS, using different points from the zone. And here are the test scores in ELA and math. Okay? So as you can see, as you get closer to the zone's borders, actually the test scores uh, are falling. Now, here is the 2004 cohort. Okay, so these are kids who actually are eligible. You see that the percent enrolled is uh, very close to zero. Until you get close to the zone, then it actually starts to go up. <laughs> oh, what does this thing do? Oh, okay. It's like, you gonna give me something broken? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me see if I can do that. I'm sure that all, it's gonna, all it's gonna break. One. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm doing a talk about whether or not communities are important, and everyone's having to help me with my own talk. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm going to keep talking. Let's see if we can get this thing to work. So the, the identification uh, is coming from this, the difference between these two sides, okay? Uh, various cohorts, kids who are eligible, kids who are not, and distance, distance interacting with cohort. Just want to show you that, okay? So here are the results. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she, she knew that didn't work. <laughs> Let's see if I can spend up some more of his time. Um, okay, so <laughs> I had to call you. Out. <laughs> so here you go. Uh, here's fifth grade when the kids. So April 14th of their fifth grade year is when this lottery happened. So I'm showing you their test results in fourth grade and in fifth grade. No treatment has happened yet. Okay, this is for math scores. All right, uh, the, the dot, the dashed black line is the average black kid in New York City public schools. All right, the dashed gray line is the average white kid in New York City public schools. Okay, the red line are the lottery losers, the blue line is the lottery winners. Okay, so now to your point, I still don't have it about whether or not they have motivated parents. I don't have that here, point taken. 
If you were to do this in KIPP or some other charter school in New York City, they'd be a quarter standard deviation above the, the city average before they ever started. Okay? At least that's not the case here. Um, so you see what's happening. Now these are the ITTs. This is just, did you actually win the lottery? Okay, so these, so for kids who, um, who went for two days and then left, they're still in here. This is the ITT. This is the lower bound. All right? There are no controls here. I don't have any free lunch stuff. I ain't controlling what kind of car they drive. I'm nothing like that. Okay? So these are just raw treatment effects. Oops, wrong way. Here is if you look at uh, the actual people who complied with the lottery versus the control complier mean. What that means is these are people who actually were admitted and went. So this gets closer to the treatment on the treated, the effect of actually going to the Harlem Children's Zone. Okay? Again, I have zero controls here. So what you see is the same thing, very similar. A uh, increase in sixth grade, an increase in seventh grade, and a big bump in, seventh, in eighth grade. Okay? Now we have these data. This is the, which cohort is this? Um, these are the 2005 cohort. We have the data for the other cohorts, and it's very, very similar. So this is not a one-year thing that's happening here. Okay? Now, I just want to pause and look at this for a little bit, because at least in my work, I'm always constantly staring at, like, 0.2 treatment effects. Okay? And you, so you sit there, and you say, this has two stars versus one star. This is 0.2, and, this, you know, this is great. This is, like, 1.2. It's very different. Okay? And so I remember when the uh, uh, first time that, like, you know, you have these data programs, the data spits out. This part is laser. Oh, his laser works. <laughs> 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 Next time I'll study the ratio of gap and laser. Slide switch or something. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, <laughs> going to hurt me. Yet. So, um, first time I, I saw this, I, first I thought it was a mistake. But then, once we really looked at the numbers and realized that there was actually something here, I had a great time because I have, you know, a few full-time RAs and, and they're like, you know, our, our former Harvard undergraduates, as I said, went out to them and I said, you know, we really got to think about this gap here because there's like a white-black gap going on. And uh, I'm not sure why you guys can't actually achieve. <laughs> um, I would start with your culture. <laughs> I, I said that, and they were like, well, if we went to Hall, I was like, just calm down. Just relax. Okay, so that's math, and that's great. On ELA, uh, things are more muted. Well, can we go back one slide? So yeah, sure. So even though there are these huge treatment effects going yeah. on in grades 7 and 8, yeah. the, the average for all black children in New York City is kind of staying flat. Yes. So is that true, because, and it's mechanically true, because the people who aren't being treated are actually doing worse? Uh, yeah, but this is like 200 kids, so, and there's like, you know, 500,000 black kids. So even, if, even if they, weren't, even if they right. were doing a little bit better, you wouldn't even expect the, the mean line. It's, it's going down. Yeah. So they're yeah. actually the ones who are, you know, were complying and actually didn't get in or doing worse. Yeah, what I should do here, this is the average in New York City. What I should do is put the average in Harlem here. Right. And, you know, I can do that. I don't know what it looks like, but it's not clear to me that, you know, we know middle schools are uh, a, a place where gaps really start to open up. But it's not clear to me that if you looked at just the poorer place, I mean, you know, they're, they're, this is all black kids, and, the, and the, the treatment and control is just basically Harlem kids. Okay. That's a fair point, totally fair point. I should put it here. Okay? Now, ELA is not as uh, dramatic. However, if I'd shown you this first, you, you would have left happy. Uh, you see the same thing here. Um, all of them, they, they kind of go down, and there's a little bit of a difference here, and basically this difference is about whatever, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 uh, standard deviation differences. You see a little bit more in the control complier mean. Okay? So the ELA results are not as impressive at all as the math results. Why is that true? I don't know. Uh, one thing I do find interesting, though, is if you look at the elementary school results that I'm going to show you in a minute, those math and ELA are both going in lockstep together. They're both just as big. So there are obviously these theories out there that say, if 
by the time they're in sixth grade, it's very tough to move language relative to math skills, et cetera. This is consistent with that. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. Okay, so let me show you the distribution. Because you might be thinking, well, Harlem Children's Zone is probably just good at like taking up the kids who are already motivated and, and the rest of them really didn't happen. So here you just see the, the distributions between the winners and the losers. Again, this is back to the ITT. Um, this is just the distribution in fifth grade. It's very similar. Okay? In seventh grade, what you see is that, and this is, is this math? This is math. Uh, the lower kids, you see a push here. Okay? By seventh grade, you see the distribution start to separate. By eighth grade, you just see the, basically the pulling apart of these distributions. Okay? Um, I always like it when you can give a paper and pictures instead of like saying, you know, uh, if you squint real hard. So, um, so that, that's great. Um, in ELA, you basically find nothing that looks like that. Uh, very similar in fifth grade. Sixth grade, very similar. Seventh grade, incredibly similar. In eighth grade, you find a little push out. Okay? Why do you find that push out in eighth grade? I don't know. But um, <laughs> when I was going over the results with Jeff Canada, I said, this is curious, man. You got nothing here in this little push out right amongst these kids. And if you know New York City Public Schools, they rate things in scales of uh, four. One and two aren't provis proficient, then three and four, right? And if you look at it like that, if you discretize it, you realize all of it's coming from two to three. <laughs> all of it's coming from two to three. And I said, Jeff, I, don't, I, said, I don't even know a model that predicts that. He's like, I do. I said, well, what's your model? He said, I told the kids, if you went from a two to a three, you got a trip to Disneyland. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't, I have no idea if that's what happened, but he is unapologetic that those kids went to Disneyland. Um, okay, so let me show you something a little bit different, which is uh, you might be thinking, yeah, Roland, well, those are um, effects from uh, the, the state test scores in New York City, and they concentrate on the test. They teach to the test, and I would argue that with you till the, till the night and all that, but that's fine. But let me just show you something that's not even like for public consumption in some sense. Let me show you something that's just for HCZ kind of internal purposes. So we found out that HCZ gives the Iowa test of basic skills, okay? Uh, just for their kind of internal, one of the internal tests they give kids. Some people give chapter tests, they do that also. They also give the Iowa test of basic skills, okay? So here, a straight line is normal growth. So if you're going up, you're doing more than average growth. The dotted line is kind of obviously the 50th percentile, okay? I don't have treatment effects here for you because the control kids were not in schools that gave the Iowa test of basic skills. So all I can show you is how Harlem Children's Zone kids are doing by themselves. And you can make up your own mind whether or not this is big or small or I, I don't know. But I think it's something interesting and I want to show you all the data we got. So you see in math scores, uh, they're gaining they're, I mean, they, they, on another test, not the actual state test itself. Uh, very similar. Uh, this is the 2005 and 2006 cohort here. Uh, similar thing in a different cohort. Uh, in reading scores, they're going up in the 2006 cohort a little bit. This is going up and then it's flat. Uh, they're not near the 50th percentile. So that's, you know, that's something. One should consider that, uh, whether or not the treatment effects are Huge, I don't know again because I don't have the control group, but I wanted to show you this. Um, this is a, some summary statistics for the lottery, winners versus losers. The point is there are no p-values that are small. Uh, here are the middle school lottery results. Let me just put some numbers into uh, the pictures that I gave you because we all have the kind of, you know, uh, you reduce class size from 24 to 16, you get 0.22 standard deviations. You have a Teach for America teacher, she gives you 0.15 standard deviations in math, 0.03 in reading. You know, you, we can go on about basically 0.2. Right. So uh, let's just look at what happens. If we take the 2005 cohort, okay, you have about 0.2 in the ITTs, about 0.279 in the treatment on the treated, okay, uh, for sixth grade math score, for seventh grade math score. It goes up even more. By eighth grade math score, these are big things here. These are standard deviation units. I haven't divided by anything. I didn't pull one on you, okay? Here's the 0.733 standard deviations in the ITT, 
1.112 in the treatment on the treaty. Okay? Um, ELA score, not as big, but when you get to the end, it's about 0.239 and 0.363. Okay? You can look at the paper. I, I want to get to, to more things here, but 2006 cohort, um, this is an old table. We, we, we now have these results, but you can see the pooled samples, et cetera. It, it's robust across years. That's what I want to be able to show you. Now, let me show you some IV results. Yes. Yes. Question. I mean, it looks like, kind of based on that, that about uh, only about two thirds or three quarters of the people that won the lottery ended up attending. Uh -huh. um, or like the difference, of just from going from the ITT to the treatment on the treated. Um, not quite, because the, the the treatment on the treated all is like you know. Um, um, yeah. No. Actually, so, something. Right. Yeah. So something like some that. not completely trivial fraction decided not go. to go. So I'm just curious. Do you have any sense where they were going and that kind of gets at like the, the treatment effects? What is it's the difference between Harlem Children's Zone and yeah. is it the neighborhood yeah. schools? Is it some yeah. other great charter outside of the zone? Is yeah. it for the vast majority it's just the neighborhood schools in Harlem? The vast majority. All right, so let me show you the IV results. Okay, now we have to decide what inside versus outside the zone means. Um, and I don't have any good theory on that, so I've shown you multiple ways where you, def, you, know, you take 800 meters outside the zone, you take 1,600 meters outside the zone, 2,400 meters outside the zone, et cetera, okay? Uh, and as you might expect, as you get 2,400 meters outside the zone, you know, you're over in Columbia University and the more fancy places, and so, you know, the, uh, the comparison groups are a little, a little different. Yeah, does Jeff Canada teach African and African American history in his school? Um, Yes, but not, in, um, not more so than, you know, uh, a typical charter does. I mean, a typical school does. I think the difference is that, uh, where, the, where the difference potentially could be, is that there are a tremendous amount of positive male role models, et cetera, who are there teaching the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. So or did it incorporate into the regular curriculum? Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. I don't know the answer. Uh, okay, so you see the lottery estimates in general are big. I mean, the IV estimates in general are bigger. Okay? Uh, so now, by eighth grade, you're looking at, you know, 1.3, 1.5, 1 1.3, depending upon how you actually define this. In the ELA, you're still around 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Okay? So what's, what's kind of, <laughs> here's what I take away. It's a little over a, a, a standard deviation. <laughs> Treatment effect in math, about 0.3 in ELA. Okay? So we do the results by subsample, um, by girls and boys, um, for example, and you don't really see big differences except for the eighth grade math score here. Okay? And you see it on boys. Again, that's something that we haven't, has not been consistent in the literature. You know, it, it, my reading of the literature is if you look at intervention projects, the ones that are the ones that work are more likely to work for girls than they are for boys. Uh, Harlem Children's Zone is a little different than that. Okay. Uh, the elementary school IV results, okay. Uh, here I don't have nice pictures to show you because they were just in third grade. <laughs> uh, so it would just be a dot. Um, here you see the math scores are about 1.9, 2, 2. Now you're saying, why are the elementary school things larger? Well, they had an extra year. Okay. So the average basically is about you know, um, 0.4 a year or so, and these people, these kids had an extra year because they went kindergarten through fourth grade, right? These other ones are just sixth through eighth, so they've had an extra year as a larger treatment effect. What's interesting here is that the ELA scores mimic the math scores in, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in the elementary school. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, was, I saw her. I was just ignoring her. No. <laughs> <laughs> what you want? <laughs> I actually ignored that question. I'm going to go on to a different question. Oh. <laughs> the, um, reading and writing, English language arts are very, this is a very different subject in second and third grade than it is in middle school. Yes. So, do you have any breakdown of ELA scores for the third graders, reading, fluency, comprehension, mm. vocabulary, anything mm -hmm. like that? Great question. Um, we can, we just got the data. So we just got about whew, maybe 
three weeks to a month ago, we just got individual question level data for 10 million children in New York City. And, um, Is that a no, <laughs> undergraduates, girl, that's what you do. So, um, um, so we, have, we have that data, and so I, I'm not sure I'll be any good at subgrouping the questions, but, but I think the state test actually puts them in subgroups, as I think, while I'm talking. And, 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 and so, yes, we can do that, and we ought to do that. Very fantastic question. And because of my age, could you email me that question? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, great. Okay. Um, uh, we present lottery results, but as I said, the lotteries weren't really oversubscribed, but I just wanted to show you everything I know. The treatment effects are, are, are still big, but the standard errors are enormous. Uh, here's the Iowa test of basic skills in the elementary school, uh, 2004 cohort, 2005 cohort. What's interesting about these is now you're starting to get above the national median, you know? Um, and so, again, I don't have treatment effects for these, but these are some pretty, well, a little wild, but pretty, pretty, on average, pretty big gains coming, even in the Iowa test of basic skills. Okay. Now, um, I want to keep plowing through here. That's all the data I have that I can do IV or, or lottery estimates on. Now, I really want to show you some results with Baby College and with Harlem Gyms, even though I can't do it justice. I, I, they don't admit in Baby College in a way that would allow you. They don't do it by lottery. Everyone. They want everyone to be in Baby College, right? I know good for people, bad for me. Um, or Harlem Gyms, they don't do it either. So what I'm going to do now is show you some really, really simple OLS of just what happens to kids who come into baby college versus those who go to Harlem gyms and which way the selection goes, I don't know. Okay, I don't know if people select in who are, who are worse. I don't know if people select in who are more motivated. Uh, all I'm going to be able to tell you is basically uh, there, there's very little evidence of a big treatment effect on baby college. Okay? Um, so here, what I have here is Harlem Gyms and Baby College results. Now, I'm looking at the math scores in third grade. So I've traced people who have gone through Baby College and are now in third grade. And what I'm doing is looking at your third grade scores on the left-hand side, controls on the right-hand side, plus an indicator of whether or not you were in Baby College. I'm reporting that indicator here. Okay? I'm also doing the same thing for Harlem Gyms. I've also done the same thing for Promise Academy in an OLS way so you can kind of see OLS versus OLS, okay? Promise Academy still looks big. Harlem Gyms. You know, the problem with this is it's 0.2, which is basically like the effect of Head Start, 0.2. But it's measured with such error, I can't tell you much, okay? So it's, it could be, I don't know. What I'm more confident in is that Baby College um, doesn't seem to have a big effect on test scores. Uh, kids are coming to school more, they have less, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's the LA school, uh, and their total absences. So total absences, seem to, this is 0.4, it's incredibly tiny relative to the standard error. So I would say on these dimensions of achievement, I don't see any evidence that baby college had any effect. Okay? Now, when I told Jeff this, I said, your baby college ain't nothing. He says, because um, that's the way I talk, he says, oh, but you got different outcomes. You think baby college is to increase T test scores and total absences, baby college in his vision was to get parents to stop cursing out the kids. So he, he says, I don't know if that has a treatment effect or not. We have different, different, different views, different outcomes, okay? And so one of the things I want to do going forward is to collect more data on what's actually happening when people go through baby college, et cetera. All I can show you is what I have, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, there, it's a long list. Do, do you want me to? So, you know, like, you know, the stress levels, I want to understand the interaction the parents are having with the kids having come through baby college. I would like to figure out a way to understand, even if it's just through survey data, how the discipline is going. I want to um, observe parent-child interactions to figure out if the, whatever they call it, the culture, cultivation, they, uh, that theory that they teach in baby college is actually sticking. So, um, Bill Wilson, Orlando Patterson, uh, Rob Sampson, myself, we're putting together a qualitative team who's actually going into the Harlem Children's Zone to actually observe these other outcomes that it's hard to get at through administrative data, but I don't have that yet. Okay. These are only students who ended up in the charter school? Or no, these are in, in New York City public schools. Okay. So wouldn't 
So who is the, some of the people, there's some subset who went to baby college. Yes. But then there's you know, a million kids in New York City who didn't go to baby college. Yes. But the number of observations here is 109. Yeah. Who's the... These are people who signed up for the lottery. Okay, so it's only people who signed up yes. for the lottery. I was and trying to take out some of the effects that you're probably thinking about. Okay. So, so these are people who signed up for the lottery, yes. didn't get in, and didn't went to in. a public school. Went to a public school, but also went, so these people went to baby college. Went to baby college, yep. but they're not in the charter school. Not, not all of them are, so that's why we control who went to the charter school. Oh. Have you done this for the, the students that went into the, the charter school yes. to look at the effect of the baby college? Uh, yes, and it's, the, 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 subs, the samples are small, too small to actually show you anything, but so let me show you the following. Okay. Here, here's the best evidence I got. Forget the regressions. This is just saying, did you go to Harlem Gyms or not on your, on your Iowa test of basic skills? Those lines couldn't be more similar. Okay. Uh, again, this is, I want to show the, everything we have. I'm much less confident, obviously, in these results because there's no identification strategy than I am the others. But I will say, if someone asked me, is baby college knocking it out of the box, I would say I doubt it. Uh, and so again, you just see that these things are following very similarly, whether or not you went to Harlem, Harlem Gems. Okay. Okay. This is what this, this yes. is what I'm thinking. Okay. Going back to your, this is the speculative part. Of it. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Let's call it that. <laughs> yeah, no, this is. I, I want to be honest with you. I mean, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm confident that these regressions are are correct. What they measure is a different story. The um, the graph you had up there on um, performance um, of. Um, in lottery, yes. In school, not in school, but in the lottery, where the the performance of the kids who did not get into the school but who were in the lottery was flat or declining, uh -huh. but the performance of the schools of the kids who got into the school was increasing. You had that very dramatic result yes. for the math. I'm right. interpreting that graph right. Yes, that's true. Okay, so all of those kids, those two samples, the ones who performed well, the ones who did not. On average, their parents are the, are the same. Yes. Because it's just a random That's right. draw, right? That's right. In that school, if that school is doing something for those parents <coughs> who want to do something and it's working, you, you might be able to pick that up with, the, with the, um, whether or not they actually went to the, to the baby college. That last statement might not be right. No, no, so I think what you want me to do is you want me to run an interaction term between baby college and like the treatment, whether or not you have right. a baby college and the That's treatment right. effect. So what you really want, now that I got to click it, it works, um, is that you want, you want this, you want the subsamples to be baby college, not baby college. That's right. If I have the data, I can do it in, in minutes. I don't know if I have the data, but I'll, I'll check. It's a great, <coughs> great point. Uh, I'll see. Um, you know, the, the problem with this, obviously, is, you know, even, we got 486, so even when we're splitting by gender, <laughs> we're, we're on the edge, so we have to be a little careful, okay? And you know, more years, more data. I mean, I, I think of this as the first project, not the last project, uh, in terms of, of these treatment effects. Okay, so let me keep rolling here. Um, okay, what have we learned? And then I wanna open it up, obviously, for discussion, and you can beat all this up more than you already have. Uh, I think what we've learned is the Harlem Children's Zone, or at least the Promise Academy schools, are enormously successful at boosting math achievement and ELA achievement is, is, is not as good. Uh, ELA and math in elementary school and math achievement in middle school. Now what else can we squeeze from the data? Okay, now here's where speculate. Is it communities versus or schools? So let me show you what investments you get if you're a community versus school, reiterating what we talked about before. The community bundle, bundle you get the early childhood programs, the public elementary school programs, et cetera, just in the community bundle. You get the after school stuff, et cetera. There's also a kind of student family bundle. Maybe this is a bad way of thinking about it, but if you're a sibling of a kid who gets into the lottery and you're in that family, you're going to get some sort of investment, right? Because Jeff Canada, he sends fruits and vegetables home, okay? He sends pre-made meals home to the kids. He uh, gives a bunch of material support, advice to parents. You also have greater knowledge about the community programs if you have a sibling that's coming home saying, I'm going to go in the all-night basketball game that's happening at the, at the rec center, and they told me about it today at school. All right? That's what I think of the student-family bundle. Then there's just a pure school bundle. Now, 
What is Jeff Canada doing? Uh, on several trips to the Harlem Children's Zone, I've tried to figure this out because, you know, it, 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 it's like a little mystical when you, when you first see it. And so we went to the Harlem Children's Zone and we just interviewed the principals, the teachers, the kids, and that kind of stuff. Honestly, it was like a bad episode of Law and Order because the, the principals, I would say to the principal, wow, look at these effects in math. How do you, what do you think's happening? He said, strong principles. <laughs> okay. And then you go to the teachers, you say, how do you think you can explain this? And they'll say, just good teaching, boy. Just good teaching. So, so I'm not sure we got much out of it, but what we did get out of it was that um, the, the kind of list of things that they're actually doing inside the school. So they give health and dental services, okay? So if you're sick, you're not feeling well, you go right, uh, at least in the, in the middle school, the health and dental services are right inside the building. They're not if you're in elementary school, and I actually think that's interesting. Um, they have social workers inside the school. So I remember when I, when I was a kid and you look out and see if it was sunny outside, you just hit someone upside the head, you could go home. Here, you can't go home. They like talk to you about your feelings. I mean, that's terrible. <laughs> so they got like social workers. So you get in a fight here, you get pulled away, you know, why did you do that? Do you feel regret? All that stuff. <laughs> and then you go back into the classroom, okay? So they also have data-oriented instruction. So, you know, it's not like the term, which is used a lot in education reform. What they do is they test kids every six weeks. They break the test down by skill. So they know whether or not uh, Mel is, understands linear equations with one unknown. And then he gets two hours after school every day to practice on the things that he's the weakest. Right? Okay. You got more time in school. These kids, they stay in school from eight to six and they only get 27 days out in the summer. In the winter, when they go home for uh, uh, Christmas break, Jeff Canada pays them $50 a day to come back. Okay, so if you actually calculate it, they spend twice as much, literally twice as much time in school relative to uh, kids in normal public school. So every time I want to borrow money from Jeff, I tell him, I'll tell your elementary school kids it's not normal to be in school till six. He's like, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> Uh, this may seem silly, but they really, you know, like I've been in a lot of schools and the environment in the schools is, is pretty incredible. Like the teachers seem to, I know it sounds silly, but they really care about these kids. Uh, they have skilled teachers, they have student incentives, they have nutritious uh, school lunches. So he's got like the whole foods basically there. Like, you know, you go in, you get like whole grain and like, you know, broccoli. I never eat there. It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> they have a coordinated after school program. So it's not like your normal after school program, which I participated in as a kid, where you break from school, you get like 10 minutes, then you go to the after school people and you just show out, right? No, it's these after school people come into the school in like the last few periods, and it's a seamless phase in the after school. The other teachers, you notice they're not there, you're working on your stuff. It's very, very, different. Now, this is cool and all, but it makes the statistics impossible, okay? So, communities or schools? Well, I don't really know, okay? But let me tell you four pieces of evidence that suggest that changing communities alone won't do the trick. Number one, our IV strategy compares kids relative to other cohorts in the zone that were not eligible for the lottery. So in some sense, our IV strategy purges much of the community effect, okay? Second, I'm going to show you these results in a minute, I think. Siblings of, of the zone kids who had access to all the community programs, but for random luck were not actually in the, in the schools, show no gains. Okay? So if my brother gets in the Harlem Children's Zone versus I don't, into the, into the actual schools, and I don't, I'm still in the community programs. I know I have pretty good knowledge of the community programs because it's my brother my test scores don't move. My absences go down, and that's probably because my brother's in school all day, and my mother's like, you need to go to school too, but um, my achievement doesn't actually go up, okay? When we do an analysis of subsamples, uh, like the boys versus the girls, we notice that kids inside the zone don't have any uh, difference in effect of the actual charter schools relative to kids who are actually outside the zone. Um, fourth, uh, if, you look at, if you look at the MTO experiment, uh, you know, where they move neighborhoods. I think if you designed an experiment, you said, Roland, we should design an experiment where we're going to change neighborhoods but not change schools. 
MTO would probably be like really, really good. I mean, that's like to a first order approximation, that's basically what they did. Okay, I mean, not on purpose, but folks move neighborhoods, but they're going to very, very similar schools. And what you see is that the girls' achievement doesn't change; the boys' achievement actually goes down a little bit. And the last thing, which is purely speculative and shouldn't should be a separate point here, is if you talk to Jeff and you say, "Why did you start charter schools?" He said, "Because my community investments, I didn't see any return in terms of the actual achievement of the kids going." Okay, so four pieces of evidence, one anecdote. Uh, here are the sibling results. Uh, you see that the math score, it's 0.2, but it's, it's measured with such error. ELA score is this. The absences are actually statistically significant, so nine less absences. Um, being on time to grade level is nothing more. So these are looking at just the set of siblings in the Harlem Children's Zone. One kid goes to the charter school, the other kid does not. Uh, you don't <coughs> see differences in achievement that, that are that big. Now, Here's a very speculative discussion, and I'll probably end it here, which is what's driving the school bundle? Okay? You got all this stuff, health, mental health, longer days, a chef in the school, all this stuff. What, 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 can, I, what can you parse out from this? Well, it's literally impossible to disentangle what the heck they're doing. I mean, we got, they got like 12 things, right, and, uh, and uh, uh, just a, a few schools, all of which are doing all 12 things. And, you know, I, I, I want to run the experiment where you test all the different possible combinations of the bundle, but that's two to the 12 experiments, and I'm too tired for that. And um, so, but I, I can tell you, I, I don't think, just based on other people's research, not my own research, it's purely speculative, I don't think it's teacher incentives and value added alone, right? Because there's, there's other folks who are doing teacher incentives tied to value added, they're not getting any results that look anything like this. Uh, I don't think it's social workers alone. I mean, we have programs like Turnaround for Schools, et cetera, that put the social workers inside the schools. They're not getting any effects of anything close to this. Um, it can't, I don't think it's student incentives alone. I, I've been doing lots of those. I can tell you, I don't have any pretty graphs like this to show. Uh, I got some interesting results, but not of the magnitude that these results are. And you know, I don't think it's longer school day alone, because again, there have been other people who have done things like lengthening the school day. and. Um, uh, sorry, and uh, not getting really great results. So what, what could it be? I thought they were cheating. I really did. It, it turns out we got the question level stuff that I talked about before, and we looked at like excess variation. We ran the Brian Jacob and Steve Levitt algorithm for how to catch cheating teachers, and it turns out they're not cheating, or at least cheating very well. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell the difference between cheating very well and not cheating. So it could be amazing teachers, though. Uh, they have some very, 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 very good teachers. Okay, so eighth grade math, there's this guy named Mr. Petit. He's an ex-Marine. He's a six foot three black guy who, you know, does like math as a combat sport. Okay, <laughs> uh, and he is unbelievable, right? And, and, and he's a very interesting guy. What I, what I think it is and what economists typically have kind of troubles thinking about is interactions between elements of the bundle. Okay, and so, you know, at least when I was in graduate school, the cool thing to do was to estimate a partial derivative. I held everything else constant, and I increased the school day. So I know exactly the school day, you know, so, you know, because it wasn't cool to like have like four things, all of which could be interacting in ways you didn't know, but the, the combined effect was large. That wasn't cool. What was cool was to estimate a partial derivative, right? And my sense is, I'm not saying anything deep here, is that the total derivative may be far more interesting, right? If you have better teachers with a longer school day, with something else, maybe that total, right? You remember the chain rule? <laughs> maybe that total derivative is actually a lot higher. Okay, so I think trying to understand elements of the bundle, I mean, interactions of the bundle is, is really important. Let me tell you about what we're doing next, uh, and then I'm happy to stay as long as you want for questions. Uh, we're looking at longer term right now in non-educational outcomes, things like teen pregnancy, crime, and so on, okay? And before I make a uh, a stronger statement about communities versus schools, I want to look at other outcomes where you think the communities would have much more of an effect than actual just uh, test score achievement, et cetera. The other thing we're doing is we've been working with uh, the Obama administration who plans to roll out uh, 20 of these across the country in a way that will, you know, putting them together in a way that will maximize learning, right? So, you know, I'm a nerd. And I called up folks in the administration. I said, hey, you're rolling out this thing. How are you rolling it out in a way where we're going to be able to learn 
which kind of is, is what's driving what, because you can roll it out in a way, and they said, that's a good question. I said, no, it's not. You spend a billion dollars, you ought to be able to tell me you know, uh, how to do that. And I have concrete ideas about how to do that. I'm happy to talk about that. The last thing, and then I'll shut up, is one of the things I'm so interested in is, of all this, is trying to figure out, um, okay, let me piss some people off, what the pill looks like. Okay, I, I want to figure out what the, what the magic bullet might look like. You know, he's doing 12 things. Could we figure out four or five of those things to actually try in a random school-based trial in regular old public schools? Because personally, I'm not that interested in just, you know, there's a set of charters that are all closing the achievement gap. That's great. The question is, how can we take that stuff and actually close the gap in, in public schools? And, you know, if, you know, we asked Jeff, so I did. I said, hey, Jeff. I want to do an experiment. I want to take four things you're doing. What should those four things do, be? He would say, human capital, the human capital piece, you've got to have the good teachers. You've got to be able to pay them in, 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 the, in the way that's going to attract the right people. Uh, longer school day, data-oriented instruction, and the culture piece. You've got to make sure that everybody in the hallways, from the teachers to the janitors, thinks that 100% of these kids can go to college. If you don't have that, you never, you're going to fail. So I would like to figure out, I know that's complicated, how you do an experiment like that and all that. I, I get it. But, the goal would be to try to figure out, are there three or four things that we should take from this or a KIPP or an Achievement First, put into a, a school-based randomized trial where we get 100 schools to, try, to, to sign up, 30 of them get this four-element treatment, the others don't, to see if we can actually get gains over three years that look like the Harlem Children's Act. All right, so but la last statement there, I promise I'll shut up. My, uh, here's why I'm so excited about this. I think before we conducted this analysis, I, at least for me, I was sitting at my computer saying, oh my God, nothing works. Nothing works, nothing works. It's contributing to fatigue, people saying nothing can work. This is all, you're just wasting your money. Nothing can work, nothing can work. Now I feel like we're in a spot where there is something out there that is actually, I think, has parts of the, of the tonic, it, it, it's actually working. The question is, how can we boil that down to pill form so you can transport it to other places? But for me, that's a much, 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 much better place to be in. I know there's something. I just don't know what it is versus maybe there never is. There never will be. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, a quick question about the 20 um, places. Uh, obviously, the first thing that needs to be part of the pill is somehow cloning Jeff Canada type leadership. I totally disagree with that, in the, in the best way, with all due respect. I just, I, I, like, okay, the question, the question is, she, she says, and I get this question all the time, is that uh, one of the most important things is going to be to clone Jeff Canada. No, no, it was his type of leadership. Okay, his type of leadership, okay? That's a broad concept. Okay, that's a broad concept, so now I'm more on your board, more on board in the sense that he is a good manager, okay? He does and that's it. He's a good manager. And we, the supply of good managers, I think, is large. So I don't, but a lot of people think he's a mystical figure who somehow miraculously can change schools because he's so smooth. I say, no, he's like my uncle. He just got a job. That's the only difference. <laughs> and, and, so he, and he's, so I mean, he's good at this as he can raise money, but he's a good manager. He has good performance management. He sticks to goals, has timelines. And I think we got a lot of folks out there like that. We certainly got 20. Yes. At children's zones. Yes. But that's a that's a very important variable in terms of how a kid feels like they belong. Yeah, I, I, I can add it to my list of things I don't know. But yeah, I think that I think you may be right. I mean, it, it's it's part of what's going on. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think I think you, you could be right. Yeah, sure. yeah. Are you familiar with that experiment they did back in '84 down in North Carolina State where they had a group of college students participate? Afrocentric classes versus the non, and the ones who were in Afrocentric classes had their GPAs improved by 1.2. No, I haven't so, seen that. Okay, but I'm just. Please saying, send it to me. I would like to read it. Okay. Please do. Right. Please do. You have a question from Kirk Kent Thompson of the school. Uh, 
Yes and no. I, I have a I have a cost per kid. In the, I have a cost per kid in the zone. I don't know what denominator kids take up the program. Okay, so that's five thousand dollars per kid. Okay, he raises fifty million dollars a year. He's got ten thousand sixty six kids in the zone that he treats for one service or the other. And you know, so that's the fifty million. How much of that gets allocated to the schools versus not? I don't know. But it's it's in the it's in the three to five thousand dollar over and beyond what normal New York City public schools get per kid. I have a question about your definition of schools and communities. It's been interesting <laughs> to hear schools discussed in contrast to the community. Yeah. Schools are such an important part of communities. Yeah. Um, I will admit I really don't understand your question, but I'm happy to answer it anyway. Um, um, uh, yes, okay, the sleight of hand I did on you today was I redefined what a school is. Okay, that's the sleight of hand I did, which is I've got, you know, I've said it's schools, but I've got schools that, you know, he's got a school that's, uh, got, you know, social workers inside the school, you know, bop, 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 right? The reason I did that is because I think we, there's a lot of public schools who are doing that. Like the number of New York City public schools I've gone in and seen a dentist in, in the next room from the ELA teacher is amazing. And so I, I think we can get there in terms of our definition of school. So I think that, I, I'm using the broadest definition of what school is. And I just really want to contrast that with purely community programs that are after school, et cetera, in terms of driving achievement. Now, whether or not they affect teen pregnancy and those other things, I don't know that yet, but that's, that's coming. These kids really aren't old enough. Right? The, 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 the oldest kids in the zone right now are in 10th grade. So they'll be in 11th grade soon, and then they'll start doing the stuff I did in 11th grade. We'll get some good data. Okay? But, and, 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 and so, 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 so that's just the reason, with just a time constraint, we're waiting. Yes? Uh, I know in the, oh, some parents schools there's a, a huge attrition problem. So yeah. Oh, it's in the paper in the tables. I don't know. Um, it, it is lower than, it's I, I think it's roughly the same. I think it's a little lower than, 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 the, than public schools in Harlem, but I think we report it in the paper. It doesn't really matter for our statistical analysis because as soon as you are in, we're, we're fine. But I don't, we report it in the paper. I just, you know, age. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't that, know, know the number, but it's in the paper. Yes? Um, I don't think we need to clone more Jeffrey candidates, but I think we need to talk a little bit more about what he did. Yeah. Because there's not very many people in our country that are doing what he did, which is he carved out his own community and he identified what he thought worked over time. Yeah. And he was brave enough to say, I'm going to raise enough money to set my own rule. Yeah. So I'm not going to have to play by the rules of the game as the state or yes. the city or the yes. district or the yes. country dictates it. Yeah. And that's a huge thing. Yeah. Because as long as you're a leader that has to lead by the terms of how you get your money, yeah. you can never set it up to necessarily be affected by what you think is effective. Okay, I, I was with you until your last sentence, which is he still has to lead by the terms of which he got his money. Um, there's no such thing as free money. I've noticed yeah. that. I, so, so, you know, so I, I have lots of funders too, and they're all like, Roland, we got ideas. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, 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 but, but, he, but I take your point. He's got a lot more flexibility than the average person who's over a school, but not the average person who's over a charter school. So, so, so two points. I think, you know, the flexibility to be able to, to develop solutions that you think are important locally is potentially a, an important thing. Second, which I didn't even mention yet in the talk, is that, you know, if you look at Caroline's work on charter schools, you realize that there's a distribution of treatment effects in the right tail of that distribution. Other schools that don't have any of these community programs are getting, you know, 
exactly the same results, but very similar. If you look at the work that Josh Angeris and, and Tom Kane are doing using charter schools in Boston, you know, they're finding very similar results. Again, they don't have the, the, the community element or the Jeff Canada part of it, but what they do share is this kind of, you know, a, a few elements. You know, they have longer school days, they basically, I, don't, I hate this no excuses thing because whatever. But anyway, so, so they, 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 they basically uh, educate kids with whatever it takes. Uh, and so it has a lot of the flexibility that you've added. But, but again, I just, Jeff's wife hates it when I say this. I told her, your, your man is not all that. She was like, you don't know. So, so I think, that, <laughs> but, but, because uh, I, I, I hate to keep harping on that. I just think it's really important because even people who are his funders think, oh, it's just because we got Miracle Jeff and this can never be replicated. And I'm like, yeah, but there's lots of, there are other schools that are getting similar results. And so, I think that's too convenient to say this is some miracle. I think the best thing we can do as researchers is collect data and try to demystify actually what's going on and make it more formulated. Well, we have one. So, so we're, we're gonna, that's going to be some of our outcomes that we do. So let me just say, it, you know, it's, I don't know, this is a very complicated question because it, I, I think, I, I'm not sure I trust people who go around and say, do you want to go to college? Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know if I trust that, right? Um, but I can tell you there is no expectations gap between, there are no big group differences in expectations. I think some of the group differences come in and how you actually achieve those expectations um, in terms of like the systematic ways, you know, I want to be a scientist, but I don't like science, that kind of thing. But, but I, I don't think if you look at expectations, at least in the data I know about, you look at the ECLS, if you look at the GS, GSS, et cetera, if you look at those, you know, and if, and if you ask, is your kid going to be, what, what degree are they going to get, right? A, an enormous fraction of mothers in the highest poverty places say their kids are going to get a PhD, okay? So, the, I, I, don't, I mean, I, again, I don't know what that measures, but it, it, it certainly, to the extent that it measures real expectations, there doesn't seem to be an expectations gap. What I don't know is how, the treatment effect of, of the, the charter alters those expectations uh, if it makes them more real, uh, you know, in terms of like getting them on the path to actually get there. So let me get So we should talk about this offline, but, but like one of the things that I've I learned a lot in, in the last couple of years in terms of trying to get involved in education, realize how hard it was. And uh, yeah, it's like one of the things I've learned is like, Designing a survey question, incredibly hard. Okay, <laughs> so like even your question, I'm not trying to pick on you, but like there's no way a kid's gonna be like oh. concrete. I don't know what concrete what. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, so I, think, I think I think really hard to design that, and I'm happy like offline after this to talk to you about precisely how you word that. But yet the answer is yes. People have tried to get it there. I don't know whether or not they got got gotten it to your satisfaction. Okay, with that, uh, I'd like to thank Roland for joining us. And